welcome back to Ready Player None, the only podcast that says, yeah, still. If you skipped last episode, either because of the sensitive issues contained within, or the sheer length it ended up after the edit, then here, for you, is a potted summary of chapter 17. We were privy to Wade and Artemis' first chat log, in which Wade not only hit every red flag in terms of what not to look out for in a life partner, but also managed to demonstrate a complete lack of human nature. Despite his targeted campaign of harassment, Artemis somehow found it charming enough to keep going along with him. Plot-wise, Wade also reasoned that the Jade Key is hidden in a box of Cap and Crunch, an American serial severely incompatible with the way I speak. The entire chapter was a time skip of about four months, and during that time, Wade and Artemis went on many pseudo-dates, culminating in them kissing after an ill-advised trip to a Rocky Horror Show-themed planet. The chapter ended with a foreboding sentence that Wade told Artemis how he felt about her, like a complete idiot. And so we begin chapter 18. So on one Friday night, while Wade is watching WizKids, a TV show about a teenage hacker who uses computer skills to solve mysteries, a reference which I imagine will prove completely irrelevant apart from the tonal similarities to this book, he receives an email from Ogden Morrow himself. The subject line read, We can dance if we want to! Sorry, I got overcome by love for safety dance then. The email contains a picture invite to Ogden Morrow's birthday party, one of the most exclusive gatherings in the Oasis. This is owing to the fact that Morrow never makes public appearances in the real world, and in the Oasis he came out of hiding only once a year to host this event. We learn that Morrow's avatar is called the Great and Powerful Og. Dumb. The grey-bearded wizard was hunched over an elaborate DJ mixing board, one headphone pressed to his ear, biting his lower lip in auditory ecstasy as his fingers scratched ancient vinyl on a set of silver turntables. His record crate bore a Don't Panic sticker and an anti-sixer logo, a yellow number six with a red circle and slash over it. This is an invitation to Morrow's 80s dance party to celebrate his 73rd birthday, and it's to take place at 10pm that Friday night at the Distracted Globe, a zero-gravity dance club that Ogden Morrow coded himself and continues to own. Wade checks in with Artemis to see if she got the same email, which she did, and he guesses that H, Daito and Shoto also received it. But H probably wouldn't show up because he competed in a globally televised arena deathmatch every Friday night, and Shoto and Daito never entered a PvP zone unless it was absolutely necessary. We'll see if those two sentences just end up being a contrivance to keep those three particular characters out of the action for this chapter. So the Distracted Globe is a famous zero-gravity dance club on the planet Neo-Noir. That's another word that's irreconcilable with the way I speak. Wade's never been before, owing to the exclusive guest list. I wasn't much for dancing, or for socialising with the twinked-out wannabe gunter uber-dorks who were known to frequent the place. What has this book got against twinks? The circle of life moves us all! Tonight, the club would be packed with celebrities, movie stars, musicians, and at least two members of the High Five. A long time ago, I wondered what exactly a movie star or a celebrity of the future may be. But why exactly do they still need movie stars? If you can perfectly simulate, say, 80s thriller war games, why not just replicate movie stars? It's almost as if the world building in this book makes no sense and serves only to push forward the agenda of the 80s being above all else. Wade dresses like Peter Weller in Buckaroo Banzai, because the author of this book wants you to know that he's seen a movie once. Underneath his light grey suit he's got body armour and tons of concealed weaponry, because Neo-Noir is a PvP zone. It was extremely dangerous to go there, especially for a famous gunter like me. So Neo-Noir is the largest and oldest of the hundreds of cyberpunk planets throughout the Oasis. Hundreds of cyberpunk planets. Imagination truly is dead. And as if to prove that imagination truly is dead, we're given a description of what the planet looks like, and it looks like every noir cyberpunk city you've ever seen in every movie that contains one. So the distracted globe was a massive cobalt blue sphere, three kilometers in diameter, floating 30 meters off the ground. And it's located at the intersection of the Boulevard and the Avenue, two brightly lit streets that stretched completely around the planet along its equator and prime meridian. <laughs> oh my god. I was warned about this. So this paragraph then. I made a big entrance when I arrived in my flying DeLorean, which I'd obtained by completing a Back to the Future quest on the planet Zemeckis. Now you might think, 
Surely everybody who's completed that quest on the planet Zemeckis must also have a flying DeLorean. The DeLorean came outfitted with a non-functioning flux capacitor, but I'd made several additions to its equipment and appearance. First, I'd installed an artificially intelligent onboard computer named Kit, purchased in an online auction, into the dashboard, along with a matching red Knight Rider scanner just above the DeLorean's grille. Then I'd outfitted the car with an oscillation overthruster, a device that allowed it to travel through solid matter. Finally, to complete my 80s super vehicle theme, I'd slapped a Ghostbusters logo on each of the DeLorean's gold wing doors, then added personalised plates that read Ecto-88. I'd only had it a few weeks now, but my time-travelling, ghost-busting, night-riding, matter-penetrating DeLorean had already become my avatar's trademark. Oh, now this car is gonna sell some t-shirts, let me tell you. It's okay to just be a fan of one thing, you know that? Jeez. This reads like something you'd write when you were eight years old, and you thought that just because you liked something, it'd go together with all the other things that you liked. Yeah, that's fine when you're bashing action figures together, but this is a grown man. This is emblematic of the entire book. He shoved together four different cars from four different movies because his entire identity is based around consumption of culture. Ecto-88, are you kidding me? And you know what the cherry on top is? Ernest Klein owns this car in real life. If ever there was an indicator that Wade Watts is purely a stand-in for the author, then surely his T-Fury Frankenstein together car is exhibit A. Wade tells us he's always concerned about parking in a PvP zone. So the ignition is booby-trapped, so if anyone other than him tries to start it up, there'll be a small thermonuclear explosion inside the car to kill any would-be carjackers. And then he goes on to say that he doesn't bother, because he uses a shrink spell to reduce the DeLorean to the size of a matchbox car, and he sticks it in his pocket. He's treated like a celebrity on the red carpet, and there's an idea I quite like here of the velvet ropes along the edges being actual force fields. So kudos for that one. So it's a long crystal staircase up into the club, which turns out to be mapped along the concave interior of the sphere. The large empty space in the middle is the quote-unquote dance floor. You reached it simply by jumping off the ground, like Superman taking flight, and then swimming through the air into the spherical zero-g groove zone. How can you dance in zero gravity? There's no friction. You certainly can't move along to the beat of the music. Didn't they test this book before they released it? In the middle of all the dancers, a large clear bubble was suspended in space at the absolute centre of the club. This was the booth where the DJ stood, surrounded by turntables, mixers, decks and dials. At the centre of all that gear was the opening DJ, R2-D2, hard at work using his various robotic arms to work the turntables. What, actual R2-D2? <laughs> Yeah, actual R2-D2, because he's playing a remix of New Order's Blue Monday with a lot of Star Wars droid sound samples mixed in. When I reached the bar, I ordered a pangalactic gargle blaster from the female Klingon bartender and downed half of it. I stopped to wonder if the pangalactic gargle blaster would just completely knock him out for just long enough for me to remember that The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a better book than this is. I don't know what a Klingon is. Actual R2-D2 from Star Wars starts playing Union of the Snake, I recited, mostly out of habit. Duran Duran, 1983. This is how normal people talk. We hear a song and then tell you exactly who played it and what year it came out. Artemis turns up wearing a gunmetal blue dress that looked like it had been spray painted on. Her avatar's dark hair was styled in a page boy cut, perfectly framing a gorgeous face. Just like that character from that movie from nine episodes ago. You know, the one Ernest Klein had a crush on when he was young. Oh, remember last episode where they very specifically told us that Artemis was 19, which is over the age of consent in America? Surely that'll make Ernest Klein's subsequent descriptions of her dancing and gyrating less creepy. And the two of them clink their glasses together. This causes something of a stir in the club. Two of the most famous gunters are here. Artemis glanced up at the dance floor, then back at me. So how about it, Percy? She said. Feel like cutting a rug? I scowled. Not if you keep calling me Percy. I think I'm going to keep calling him Percy. So R2-D2 ends his set, and then he beams out like he's in a Star Trek episode. What is this Star Trek? I don't know what that is. And then Og appears behind the turntables. The old wizard was wearing baggy jeans, sandals, and a faded Star Trek The Next Generation t-shirt. What's, what's, what's Star Trek? I don't know what Star Trek is. 
and he starts playing Rebel Yell by Billy Idol, Artemis really wants to dance. She abruptly locked into the beat, bobbing her head, gyrating her hips. She takes off into the groove zone. And after a moment's hesitation, Percy follows her. Og is spinning around inside his DJ booth, which is adjusting the gravity vortex of the dance floor like an ancient vinyl disc. Now this, this threw me for a loop. Artemis winked at me, and then her legs melted together to form a mermaid's tail. <laughs> what? So she's doing some sort of underwater mermaid dance as Wade's moving towards her? Which... Given my Artemis is a six of spy theory in the last episode, I can't help but recontextualize as a siren. She turns back into human form when he reaches her, and he turns on this Travolta software for his avatar. The program took control of Parzival's movements, syncing them up with the music, and all four of my limbs were transformed into undulating cosine waves. <laughs> what, like a rubber hose cartoon? <laughs> Just like that, I became a dancing fool. So they danced together, orbiting each other like accelerated electrons. Then Artemis began shapeshifting. <laughs> she dissolves into a pulsing amorphous blob. <laughs> that changed its size and color in sync with the music. And wait, he's got this mirror partner thing on his software, so he does the same. And then all the other avatars in the club follow suit. So it's just this zero gravity field of amorphous blobs. Soon the center of the club looked like some otherworldly lava lamp. I'm sure this is not the intended reaction. Next song, Time After Time by Cindy Lauper. They're back in humanoid form again. And Wade says, I'm in love with you, Artie. She looks at him in shock and then sets up this private channel that only they can hear. She tells him that he can't be in love with her, because he doesn't even really know her. They have a hushed and desperate conversation, as Wade insists that he does know her. He cares about who she really is in real life. But like the previous chapter, Artemis insists that the Avatar is just a side of her that she shows to people. It's not a real body, it's not a real face. If I ever let you see me in person, you would be repulsed. Why do you always say that? Because I'm hideously deformed, or I'm a paraplegic, or I'm actually 63 years old. Take your pick. She tells him that because Wade spent all his life in the illusion, he can't possibly know what real love is. And Wade starts to cry. She says that they've both been neglecting the hunt. They've been spending far too much time with each other when they should be looking for the Jade Key. That's what the Sixes are going to be doing. But Wade says to hell with the competition. I'm in love with you, and I want to be with you, more than anything. Here's a nice little self-aware bit. She just stared at me. Or rather, her avatar stared blankly back at my avatar. Ooh, I actually like that. That's a nice sentence. Artemis says they need to stop spending so much time with each other. Are you breaking up with me? No, Z, she said firmly. I am not breaking up with you. That would be impossible, because we are not together. There was suddenly venom in her voice. We've never even met. This book's suddenly taking a surprisingly negative stance on the idea of long-distance relationships, but go off, I guess. She wants to stop talking to him completely until the hunt is over. And if that could take years, then all the better. Again, Wade scoffs at her idea of using the prize money to end world hunger and solve the energy crisis that we learned about so many chapters ago. The song changes and the crowd cheers, but Wade's not feeling it. I felt like a large wooden stake had been driven into my chest. Artemis was about to say something more. Goodbye, I think, when we heard a thunderous boom directly above us. The Sixers had blown a hole in the roof and they're attacking on jetpacks with blaster pistols. Half the Gunters try and fight back, but there's more than a hundred heavily armed Sixers. Wade wonders why the Sixers would attack such a group of high-level Gunters, but he realises that all the blaster fire is aimed at himself and Artemis. They were here to kill the two of us. He reasons that their presence there must have hit the news feeds and Sorrento launched an attack. Wade blames his own recklessness. Alright. And then he starts to fight back. He notices Artemis is also fighting back too, but they're separated now. In seconds, the situation escalated into the largest confrontation I'd ever witnessed. And it already seemed clear that Artemis and I were going to be on the losing side. And you'd think a large confrontation like that, with such heavy stakes, would take up more than three quarters of a page. But do I have news for you? So the great and powerful Og starts to fight back as well. You jerks think you can crash my birthday party? He shouted. His avatar was still wearing a mic, so his words blasted over the club's speaker array, reverberating like the voice of God. And he uses this red force lightning to evaporate all the Sixer avatars. And Wade calls it the most incredible display of power by an avatar I'd ever seen. Nobody busts into my joint uninvited! Og shouted, his voice echoing through the now silent club. And 
Yeah, that looks like it's just the end of the battle. Done. Easy. The avatars who are still alive and haven't fled cheer out and they restart the dance party. We've got a techno remix of Atomic by Blondie. And everyone starts to dance. Wade looks for Artemis and sees her flying out of the hole that the six has made in the roof. She stopped and hovered outside for a moment, just long enough to glance back at me. End chapter 18. Well, it was certainly less egregious than the previous chapter, wasn't it? I'm glad that Artemis has finally seen sense to try and ditch Wade, but I'm definitely not interested in this teenage dating melodrama. I do like some of the concepts, though. The velvet rope force field, this concave sphere club, the zero-g dance floor is okay, even though it doesn't make sense rhythmically. Come to think of it, would the falling masonry from the Sixer attack really be a threat? I suppose with it having no gravity, it'd just hit the opposite side of the sphere, wouldn't it? Momentum with no resistance and all that? That sounds plausible enough to be true, right? But no, I'm just not interested in the romantic lives of these two people. And just going from genre conventions, this is like the, the third act of their romance where, oh, they decide it's all a terrible bad idea and they have a falling out. You know, like the main character relationships from every animated Disney movie in the last seven years. So, you know, they're definitely going to hook back up again at some point. Do we have any more evidence of the uh, Six of Spy theory, do you think? I'm really latching onto this idea. I hope it's correct. I, d I actually don't know. In either case, she's better off without him, isn't she? Also, what's with that implication about disfigured or paraplegic people being unlovable? I can think of easier ways to ditch a boy. Anyway. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me on Twitter, at the Last Gherkin, or you can follow the show on Twitter at rpn underscore pod. Watch along with subtitles on YouTube, The Last Gherkin, or get an mp3 download at thelastgherkin.podbean.com. This episode also featured the track Smooth Lovin' by Kevin McLeod. More information in the description. In the comments below, tell me your stupid combination of pop culture references you turn into a vehicle. Join me next time when I'll have turned into a pulsing amorphous blob. A little fact for you. I made a few jokes about there being no furries in the Oasis, but the movie version of this scene in the book contains the only fursona. Yeah, that's true. Just look up the Queen of Cats, but probably do it in a private browser window, okay?